I have a large number of slides in this slide deck, large enough that if I were to actually talk to each slide, I'd have to talk very quickly and you'd have to blink very, very hard. Uh, and, and yet I think the slides that are in the deck are valuable because there are things that people can go back and look at later. For example, uh, there's one set of slides about how to set up eucalyptus images uh, that's very, very good to refer back to. What I will do is touch most heavily on those things that I think are most important to get absolutely right the first time or which are most important to your ability to uh, use future grid today and as we go forward. And uh, so that we don't interfere with lunches, I will be sensitive to time. Ah, so, so Jeffrey uh, mentioned the importance of real computational science having to do with clouds, grids, and whatnot. And, and this really was one of the, the key motivating factors. When I was early on in high performance computing, one of the things that people really paid a lot of attention to was the, the core methodology of how people did uh, scaling studies with parallel computers. Something people really cared a lot about. How you did the scaling, increased workload, uh, increased co cores, you know, all these things people took very, very close attention to. Um, Jeffrey and I had a discussion a while ago, well, a year and a half ago, uh, about the nature of grid computing research. And we came to the conclusion that most papers about grid computing infrastructure could be summarized, most papers that were published could be summarized as we built this thing and we managed to make it work. That's sort of the summary. Uh, and uh, Future Grid is very much intended to put rigorous computational science back into a lot of these uh, uh, discussions, get us with cloud computing, grid computing, scalable MPI computing to a point where we can have sensible discussions about what matters in the long run. And one of the best places to see papers on these topics and to be part of sensible discussions about what applications match with what architectures will be CloudCom 2010. Uh, the call for papers is open. Uh, it is being organized by the uh, same group of people that is uh, organizing this uh, this class, this class in the virtual school. It's going to be held November 30th to December 3rd in beautiful downtown Indianapolis. Uh, uh, paper submission is August 20th, so if you are doing research with cloud computing, grid computing, something like that now, please consider CloudCom. I think that's the only commercial plug I have. Uh, the futuregrid.org website is about to get switched over to a new version. Uh, we've uh, uh, been going through an iterative process of having something, uh, and something was a lot better than nothing. Version 2 of the Future Grid website at futuregrid.org should be up. Uh, we expect the end of this week, and it will be a considerable step forward in terms of what it provides early adopter users. Uh, we are still very much in early adopter mode, which means that we're figuring out what we need to deliver to people to help people use Future Grid. Uh, and vice versa. Uh, Jeffrey talked about some of the early usage examples. Um, this is the one slide that really, really matters in my entire talk. One is go to kb.indiana.edu if you want to search for information about Future Grid and just type Future Grid in something, Future Grid account, Future Grid eucalyptus, you know, whatever. Uh, and then the other really critical thing is if you need help with something, send email to help at futuregrid.org. Uh, that is uh, staffed by a team of experts at Indiana University who will aid you in solving any problems that you might encounter. Uh, and indeed, the, uh, the early adopters that have used FutureGrid so far have been very valuable to the project because they have helped us work out what we need to deliver for people to be able to use this effectively. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about applying for an account. Uh, there is a, uh, there's a pop song that I will not attempt to sing uh, that has a chorus that goes something like, if I had a million dollars. And 
when people think about applying for proposals to the National Science Foundation uh, for money, you know, people take that very seriously. Uh, as a person who has sat in review panels uh, looking at proposals both for money and for computer time, one of the things that I've noticed is that uh, what computer time costs in terms of NSF dollars uh, to deliver isn't always thought about as carefully as actual dollars are. So we have built uh, an application process that will help us ensure that we are good stewards of the money that the NSF in has invested in this project uh, and the money that IU and all of our participants have uh, uh, put on top. It's a non-trivial resource. It's it's uh, you know it's a expensive project. Uh, fairly expensive in terms of hardware, very expensive in terms of the personnel needed to create this. So um, there is an application process. Ah, okay, good. Uh, authentication is handled by SSH keys. Uh, if you have an SSH key already, and I suspect uh, almost everyone, perhaps everyone does, you can just upload it as part of the application process. Uh, if you don't, here's how to make SSH keys. Um, the application process uh, has several screens. It asks for your name, your email address, your affiliation. Uh, it does ask for your citizenship. There is a very, very small list of countries that are on the U.S. government's list of extremely bad countries, uh, and there are particular export uh, regulations that apply to those. Uh, and, and these are, I think there are a total of six. Uh, uh, countries that are uh, uh, regarded basically as uh, uh, harbors of terrorism. So we do need, for security reasons, we need to keep track of citizenship, but only for that reason, only to make sure that you're uh, a citizen of, of uh, some country other than this list of six. And the fact that you're in the U.S. essentially guarantees this anyway, but uh, to be safe, we can say we've asked for it. Um, you're asked for uh, sort of the basic orientation of your project, research versus education. Um, uh, you're asked what resources you might want, and one option is to say, I don't really know, uh, here's what I want to do, or it may be the case that you have very specific requests, I want to use the Cray. We've had people who said, I want to use Cray. We've had people who say, you know, just give me some, give me some VM Im images. Uh, software requests, again, the same thing. Uh, one of the keys to Future Grid is that we have involved partners from throughout the U.S. who are developing some of the very newest and most important grid middleware. So, for example, uh, we have uh, Twister, Nimbus, uh, Unicor, uh, European product, uh, G-Lite, uh, Genesis 2, Andrew Grimshaw's uh, project at University of Virginia, which is focused particularly on international grid operability and data grids. So you can select the software you want. Um, you're asked to agree to a bunch of things that we are forced to ask you to agree to by virtue of the cooperative service agreement we have with the National Science Foundation. So uh, this is not a grant where uh, the NSF wrote Jeffrey a $10 million check uh, and he gets to go off and buy a fancy new car as a result. Uh, we actually get money in increments on the basis of writing reports and saying that we have delivered specific outcomes and specific services to the nation as a result of uh, essentially a contract with the National Science Foundation. So what we ask you to agree to is to tell us all of the things that we are obligated to tell the National Science Foundation, citations, that sort of thing. Uh, we do uh, ask also that uh, you include a, uh, the standard NSF acknowledgement, which again, the NSF asks for, and, and, and that's important. Um, the National Science Foundation has invested very, very heavily in computational science generally, and giving them credit in our academic work is a reasonable thing to do. Um, user responsibility form. The user responsibility form boils down to, I won't do anything I shouldn't do, and I will keep close attention to my passwords. Uh, this user responsibility form is drawn directly from the TerraGrid. Read it, uh, but that's the quick summary. Um, 
looking at the crowd at Indiana, I know that many of the people here are graduate students, some postdocs, uh, some people with uh, PhDs and permanent appointments. I suspect that's reflective of the uh, virtual school generally. Let me make uh, a general comment and a couple specific comments. Uh, if you are ever asked to participate in a review panel at the National Science Foundation, I highly recommend it. I recommend it for two reasons. One is that it's good to contribute to the operation of the community, and all of us really depend on our proposals getting good quality, thoughtful reviews when they go into a review panel. And one way for us to give back is to be sure that we give those sort of thoughtful reviews to other people. The other thing is it's tremendously instructive to sit in a room with a bunch of other people and review proposals. First of all, you're going to learn a lot about whatever technology is being discussed. And second, you're going to learn a lot about how to uh, be successful in writing proposals and how not to be successful. And it is, it is routinely, uh, is it possible for something to be routinely stunning? It is routinely stunning for me to review proposals where the NSF has for years and years and years said the two main review criteria are intellectual merit and broader impact and look at a proposal that fails to address in any meaningful way one or both of the NSF review criteria. Uh, and, and so the application process online for FutureGrid is structured according to the review criteria. Intellectual uh, merit broader impacts. We have this toy example that uh, I think Alan Strive or Marlon Pierce put together. Uh, the intellectual merit of this proposal is that it will strike sliced bread. Uh, you can tell that this is just a toy application. If this were a real application, the proposal would say, uh, this proposal will slice bread in transformative ways that will inform our understanding of bread and all other food groups. Uh, and then, you know, other stuff. So things to fill out. Logging in, different sites are using different systems in the hands-on exercises, so the login information is in part of the handouts that you'll be getting uh, later in the actual hand-on exercises. Uh, so a little bit about Eucalyptus. Eucalyptus is one of the many sorts of virtual machines that you can get to. Uh, Eucalyptus is one that's particularly popular, uh, has been particularly popular. Uh, Eucalyptus, um, like any acronym, I think there was a lot of effort putting put into coming up with a set of words that had eucalyptus as their uh, outcome. Uh, elastic utility, computing architecture, linking your programs to useful systems. Uh, eucalyptus exists now in two forms. Originally an open source project led by Rich Walski. Uh, Rich and his lab are uh, off in the private sector trying to make it big uh, with Eucalyptus Inc. Uh, but it still exists as an open source infrastructure as a cloud service. Uh, it is uh, very much, uh, you know, a very, very standard cloud from the core up. Uh, it's essentially, to a large extent, an open source analog to Amazon Web Services. So, uh, so Rich will, will be very careful about saying that they didn't reverse engineer Amazon. Uh, they, they simply looked at how Amazon behaved and looked at the API and they built uh, an open source product where if you take a program that will run on Amazon, it will run on Eucalyptus and vice versa. Uh, it's uh, got a storage abstraction that is S3 compatible. There is a block-based storage abstraction that is uh, elastic, elastic block storage system uh, compatible. Uh, and so Eucalyptus is an extremely popular uh, open source VM. It's one that uh, we expect very, very many people will use on FutureGrid. Uh, Eucalyptus and Nimbus uh, are, uh, Nimbus is another uh, uh, open source cloud product that we think a lot of people will use uh, within FutureGrid. So uh, Eucalyptus is available on uh, India and Sierra. Uh, there's a variety of different VM images that are available, varied by uh, uh, memory s storage varied by uh, disk storage. I think I said that. Oops, I'm pressing the wrong button, sorry. Uh, so the uh, account creation process, I'm just going to flip through because you can look, that, look at that when you uh, want to. 
And uh, uh, again, I think, I think rather than spending a lot of time talking people through how to do eucalyptus in theory when you're going to be using twi Twister in practice this afternoon, I'll leave this in the slides. The slides are available online. People can look at them uh, uh, at their leisure. When you uh, want to uh, actually go to use eucalyptus, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the uh, uh, software environment. So Gregor von Lachevsky came up with this uh, RAIN acronym. Uh, the installs are either stateless or stateful. Uh, stateless is actually considerably easier to install, considerably easier to manage. Uh, we do support uh, stateful as uh, uh, one way to use uh, future grid, but as Jeffrey said earlier, uh, we're a little more careful with it. We are sort of learning as we go here. Uh, we've been very, very good, and we've been largely good and a little lucky with our security. Uh, and that, I think, is uh, what one always strives for. Uh, largely lucky and a little good will work for a while, but eventually falls apart. So largely good and a little lucky. Um, we use Moab and XCAT to actually manage the installs. Uh, XCAT is a tool that Indiana University has participated in developing. Uh, in fact, uh, one of XCAT's predecessors was used originally when Big Red was, uh, was first built. Uh, Big Red actually, uh, when we booted Big Red up, we did not boot the images from the local disks. Uh, we actually booted images for Big Red uh, over the network from disk uh, servers. Uh, that was actually quicker than booting systems from the local disks. Uh, so XCAT is a, uh, uh, a successor, a, a, a descendant of uh, that sort of tool that we've been using now for years. Uh, and just to, to put this in context, uh, with Big Red, we could reboot Big Red in a matter of minutes uh, by using uh, this uh, sort of over-the-network uh, image distribution as opposed to hour or hours. Uh, so uh, XCAT is in use today. Uh, Moab is the meta, meta scheduler that essentially says, okay, we're going to have uh, this person's eucalyptus images up on this system. Uh, at this particular time, we're going to have somebody else's Zen images up at a different time. Uh, and um, in the long run, we'll be able to change the operating system uh, and do things like power control uh, with, X, with XCAT and Moab. Uh, we are, in the long run, working on building uh, a web interface that will allow you know, people to, to pick an image, click on it, uh, put it to use. Uh, first, of course, uh, we're, we're going with command line. So FG deploy image deploys an image on the host. Um, the, uh, uh, the parameters are what you'd expect, the host name, image name. Uh, FG add adds a feature to a deployed image. Uh, and this is actually one of the particular bits that Gregor added in uh, to the development of the software architecture that you can add something to an already deployed image, which uh, we had not originally thought of and which is going to simplify everybody's life a lot in the long run. Uh, this is a draft of the GUI uh, that, uh, that we expect to have operating oh, near the end of the second year of Future Grid's operations. Uh, one of the things that we are trying to do is, is manage reproducible uh, experiments, which is one of the critical aspects of Future Grid, uh, allow sharing. Uh, Jeffrey mentioned that if you are doing experiments with Future Grid and you're willing to leave your application up or your environment up and support it so that other people can use it, that's, uh, that's very, very good. Uh, we have uh, a lot of risk to manage in terms of the images, uh, managing a lot of user space if you think about it. By the time we get some number of dozens of images per hundreds of users, uh, that is a lot of storage space. Uh, we have a, uh, a basic approach to 
per job uh, provisioning. You know, user submits a job to a queue. Uh, the the image is re is provisioned on an environment. The job runs. Uh, after the job is run, uh, you want to do two things. One is collect all the data and put it back in a spot where the user can get to it. Uh, and, and the other is wipe out the images. Uh, and that's simply a graphical depiction of, uh, of that process. Uh, we do have the ability to customize that and do an image alter the image, do a set of experiments over again. So if you wanted to do a set of performance experiments with fairly modest changes to an image, you can actually change images on the fly. Uh, one can imagine a lot, of, uh, a lot of ways that you might want to do that. Change network parameters, uh, change what you have uh, loaded into, uh, into memory, change your uh, subroutine choices, for example. Uh, and that's more detail on this point. So um, you do have the opportunity to actually set up queues for virtual organizations as well. One of the things that TerraGrid has done, I think generally and generally well, is support virtual organizations. So for example, uh, we have some discussions going with uh, groups in California, groups uh, throughout the U.S., where what they really want to do is test a new portal for use by a virtual organization. Uh, and we can do that. So, so as examples, things like the lead portal, uh, the linked environments for atmospheric discovery, uh, that's a portal that's being uh, changed right now from one set of technologies to another. Uh, we have the opportunity to support a virtual organization uh, actually, I think in this case, uh, I think one could consider the, uh, the people participating in this virtual school a virtual organization. So uh, the current status, uh, we uh, support dynamic provisioning through Moab. So we really are sort of uh, getting Future Grid to a point where it's beginning to have built into it the capabilities that we talked about when we first uh, developed this idea. Um, Sierra, uh, in particular, the uh, iDataplex uh, at San Diego and, uh, uh, in, yeah, so, so we've got one example here from Sierra. Um, here are a number of questions that have been asked about. Uh, one is, uh, performance of virtual machines is poor with InfiniBand. Well, you know, that's a statement of the state of the world right now. It's not sort of a particular characteristic of FutureGrid. And one of the things that's nice about FutureGrid, as Jeffrey mentioned, when you go off and use Amazon or uh, Google uh, or use Microsoft Cloud Services, you know, you are very, very much using a black box. And Amazon, in fact, in particular, is quite open about saying, we promise that your stuff is going to run. We make no promises from one day to the next about what the underlying hardware is going to be. So one of the things about FutureGrid uh, that, uh, that we think provides interesting capabilities as regards things like InfiniBand support is you have systems that have InfiniBand and uh, Ethernet interconnections, so you can connect uh, try different drivers, try different VMs. Uh, root access, uh, we are being particularly careful with root access uh, just because of the security concerns. Um, we are still working out the process of how to certify stateful images and how to certify images generally. Uh, a, a quick summary of the certification process uh, is that when the hardware team, you know, if we have a request to certify an image, that goes to the hardware team and the software team, and when they say it's certified, uh, it's certified, and we're, we're, again, still building the testing processes. But that's coming along pretty well. Uh, so one of the things that we are attempting to do already is uh, develop a set of benchmarks uh, that we can use to compare uh, what is the current uh, 
state of performance of Amazon, Future Grid, uh, Azure, um, you know, looking at MapReduce in the future. And we want to be able to do two things. One is study what the performance of those environments is over time. Uh, as Jeffrey mentioned, this, uh, this new announcement from Amazon uh, about supporting MPI jobs in some reasonable way really changes the picture of what Amazon is capable of doing. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, over time what's the performance characteristics of these commercial environments and also be able to say within a, within a uh, controlled environment, a future grid, what's the performance of this uh, particular uh, hypervisor, this particular VM, this particular uh, application. And one thing I should, uh, I should mention, I've talked primarily about environments and VMs. Uh, Future Grid is intended for tests of applications as well as environments. Uh, as Jeffrey mentioned, uh, it, it simply is no longer the case that any question like what's the best hardware environment or what's the best software environment. You know, these things don't have sensible single answers. Uh, so the best hardware environment for what? The best software environment for what? Uh, so we have this opportunity to uh, uh, begin uh, testing applications. Uh, so for example, you know, lead as I mentioned, blast, uh, some of these other genome assembly tools. Uh, looking at how they perform over time as these environments develop. Ah, and I said I only had one plug, but I actually have two plugs. Uh, uh, both plugs are for the same conference, again, CloudCom. Um, acknowledgements, uh, so very, very thankful to the National Science Foundation uh, for supporting the project. Very thankful to our partners. Uh, one of the things that we decided early, early on was that if we were going to create a meaningful national grid test bed, that it had to be a national grid test bed. Uh, and it's really the participation of uh, the many and diverse partners uh, that have made Future Grid a success so far. It's enabled us to bring in uh, expertise from TAC, expertise from San Diego, expertise from Chicago, uh, expertise from Virginia. Uh, expertise from across the pond in Germany, uh, and that has really made the project much more than, uh, than just the sum of the parts. Uh, and the NSF says that if you give a talk as opposed to a peer-reviewed paper, you're supposed to say that anything that I've said that's, that's an opinion is my opinion and is not necessarily endorsed, but not necessarily not endorsed by the NSF. Uh, so we have come very, very close to the uh, scheduled time period. Let me ask if there are any questions, uh, either about the material I've presented or about uh, more follow-up about Jeffrey's uh, slides. You see, there's a question. Ah, OK. And actually, uh, it's not my question. I'm just uh, reading a question in the, the Google group on Twitter. Uh, people were wondering about the mention of the word image. Could you please explain it a little bit more? Uh, about the what? Uh, the word image, um, I, I mean, you mean the Linux kernel image, right? So some ah. people in the Google group were wondering about that. So, so image in this case means the, the entirety of the software environment. So image could be as simple as uh, a basic Linux Red Hat uh, uh, installation. It could be Zen over Linux. It could be Eucalyptus. It could be... Uh, Microsoft HPC server. So, so by image, what we mean, uh, for that matter, it could be Linux with Unicore. It could be Linux with Genesis 2. So, so by image, what we mean is something, uh, we, we mean the, the, the operating system, VM, and application image in toto. So it could be, uh, you know, essentially anything that one wants to run uh, and, and, and do tests with. Uh, and, and I think in particular, uh, while we, uh, we, we want to be careful with the vetting process, uh, one of the critical advantages that FutureGrid offers is the ability to let a researcher work with an environment, 
that work with an image, work with an operating system and application environment that is not represented anywhere within the Terra grid or the Open Science grid or any other production facility uh, in the U.S. And uh, one of the reasons, uh, just to take one, one example from past Terra grid history, uh, there was at one point uh, a long discussion uh, about two different metaschedulers, and the discussion went something like this. My favorite metascheduler is better than your favorite metascheduler. And the response was, no, my favorite metascheduler is better than your favorite metascheduler. And that response went back and forth like that for months without anyone really being willing to do a full-fledged test on the production environments because everybody running in a production environment, everybody running a production environment for the Terra grid has this metric of having to have your systems up 95% of the time and having 96% of the jobs run successfully to completion. And what everybody knew was that if you experimented with uh, some metascheduler that you didn't know anything about and all of a sudden you screwed up your usage percentage or your job completion percentage, you know, you had just made your own metrics look bad in the eyes of the National Science Foundation. So, so the ability to say, I'm a researcher and I want to deploy whatever. I want to, rep I want to deploy a standard uh, Linux MPI cluster and I want to uh, do that with, uh, with my favorite metascheduler uh, or I want to deploy a science gateway and I want to do that in my favorite VM. That's really the critical aspect of future grid. Can I make a comment on uh, uh, InfiniBand? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, as for uh, Mellanox, the US ConnectX card supports virtualization, so people will be, um, we haven't tried it, but somebody will be able to use that. Cool. Fabric. Cool. Well, we, we will bear that in mind, and we, we do have, we have the ability to make some amount of changes with the future grid hardware over time. Uh, and in fact, one of the, one of the very, very uh, interesting experiments we're doing uh, with a system in California involves somebody putting power meters on one of the, uh, uh, one of the nodes of uh, Sierra. Uh, which requires us to have it recertified by IBM uh, after the experiment's done. So uh, we actually, to a limited extent, have the ability to make changes to the hardware over time, and uh, we'll look at that. So, Other questions? Uh, somebody had a follow-up question on that uh, image. Uh, if uh, I'm a chemist and uh, I have my or my favorite uh, chemistry software like Gaussian, Cucumber and Orton start in my image. The question was, can I just take it that over and deploy it in one of the future grid machines and just uh, let it go? Uh, if the it, if your favorite set of applications is all open source, then that's a piece of cake. Um, unless it's a root kitty cat. Uh, so open source applications, absolutely. Um, for things that come with licenses like Gaussian, we have the ability to support that, provided we are careful to attend to the licensing issues. So, uh, so Jeffrey mentioned uh, one application uh, with design of internal combustion engines, and that requires us to manage uh, licenses for Star CD, and we've we worked with the vendor to work all that out. So, uh, depending on the flexibility of the vendors and depending on the particulars of the software, uh, we should generally uh, be able with a little bit of work to uh, support use of commercially licensed software. Uh, but that does, that will require us to work with researchers to make sure that the licensing is taken care of. You, you can't generally just uh, um, take your own copy and, and run it someplace else. And we have, I, sh I should mention that we have licenses for an array of fairly common software 
uh, SAS, SPSS, uh, some of the engineering software, some of the math software. So there's a there's a set of tools that there's a set of tools that many many people use, and we have licenses for a lot of those tools. And for the tools that we have licenses for, then it really is a matter of scoot your stuff over and go to work. I have one follow-up question. I mean, once somebody else has that the cloud remains running on it, how do we control what software they, they are running on it? Because they, uh, they have complete control of it. Unless we don't let them deploy their own image, we restrict them to the image we provide. Ah, so uh, part of this comes down... Um, really to, to the matter of user responsibility and part of it comes down to licensing terms. So I, I summarized the user responsibility form as don't, things you should, don't do things you shouldn't do um, and watch your passwords. So using software outside of its licenses I think falls under the category of things one shouldn't do generally. Uh, I also think that we're beginning to see with some of these software vendors uh, some changes in position about licensing. Uh, vendors that I have regarded as um, tremendously inflexible a decade ago are demonstrating much more flexibility. And, and you know, the music industry sort of shows us what happens when technology changes and license holders are unwilling to, uh, uh, to change license terms, right? You know, the music industry has basically been gutted by, by its belief that uh, it could run uh, protection schemes uh, and sue students uh, into buying CDs, and, and that just hasn't worked. Uh, I think what you're seeing in the software industry is recognition that cloud environments really are changing things and the vendors have to change their license models. Uh, so I think, I think that over time, what we'll see is the development of the technology and the terms so that people can get the work done that they want done and do it reasonably and do it within licenses. Anything else? In that case, we are just in good time. Uh, an hour from now, 1.30 Eastern Time, Eastern, technically 1.30 Eastern Daylight Time, uh, and uh, do the math from there. Uh, we'll see you back in an hour. Thank you very much.